The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. In April of 2023, the government of British Columbia announced a new life sciences and biomedical strategy. The objective is to position BC as a global hub in those sectors. Minister of Jobs, Economic Development and Innovation Brenda Bailey says, we're boosting our world-class talent, innovators, entrepreneurs and anchor companies to create high quality jobs. The minister's claim about world-class talent is backed up by the fact that almost every COVID-19 vaccine candidate that reached late stage development was either initiated, developed, or manufactured by a BC company or scientist. Minister Bailey says, we're focused on building on these made in BC accomplishments. I invited Minister Bailey to join me for a conversation that matters about BC's strategy to build a vibrant life sciences, biomedical, and high tech base that will help to reshape our future. Mr. Bailey, welcome. Thanks very much for having me, Stu. You know, I have long believed that the greatest natural resource in British Columbia isn't in the woods, it's not under the ground, it's not in the seas, it's right here between our collective temples. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really what we're focused on now, isn't it? It really is, yeah. We always say our greatest resource is our people, and uh, it's absolutely true. It's also our institutions. We have extraordinary universities. And you know, in the States, you hear people really trumpeting the successes of their universities. We all know Stanford and Harvard and others, but we have world-class universities and we don't trumpet it quite the same way. Um, and those universities are a big part of why our life science sector is just doing so well. How do you think we got to this point? Like, I mean, so many people point back to, you know, Michael Smith uh, being named a Nobel laureate, but it must have started earlier than that. Mm -hmm. I think that is part of it. I, I have um, heard from a number of sources that they really follow the breadcrumbs back to Dr. Peter Cullis. Dr. Peter Cullis is um, not yet a Nobel Prize winner, although some people think that that might be something in the future, knock on wood. Yeah, yeah but just, it just awarded the Order of British Columbia. So. But just awarded uh, the uh, Order of British Columbia for his work on uh, nanolipid particles, lipid nanoparticles, LNP. And, um, and UBC is really, uh, uh, I know we say this a lot, hitting above its weight, but it's very true. And many uh, extraordinary companies have uh, grown out of UBC and uh, folks who've studied under Dr. Cullis. Um, there's also the incredible work that's gone on since the genome was sequenced, uh, which of course happened in Boston, but has had huge implications in terms of the work that's going on in our institutions as well. And I think the world-class institutions we have collide with our, our exceptional entrepreneurialism. There's something unique about the West Coast and the West Coast of Canada, us, BC, our, our sort of frontier mentality, our desire to do things differently and not necessarily by the book, um, our, our visionary thinking that comes as a result from that combined with these extraordinary universities, I think that is um, largely the reason why we see something really special happening here, not just in regards to life sciences and, and biotech, but our technology sector um, broadly, I think. So I also think that there's other interesting components in this. Uh, Terry Fox, I remember, you know, when he started his run across Canada, mm -hmm. I had no idea what the impact of one young man saying, I'm going to go and raise awareness and raise money towards research. Well, out of that Terry Fox uh, effort comes Terry Fox Research Lab, comes people like Dr. Mark O'Mara, mm -hmm. Alan Eaves, yes. and what has spawned out of that. And and so I think you're absolutely right. This This interesting dynamic of, people coming together and creating something that is truly unique, but also vitally important. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're wise to raise that. And we have historically, in Canada and, and in British Columbia particularly, done a great job at funding research, the examples you've given and others. Our challenge, though, historically has been to transition that research into commercialization. 
Yes. That's been our challenge and in many different examples and life sciences is no exception. Well, the commercialization and then uh, growing to scale. That's right. And if we can grow to scale, the economic benefit mm -hmm. to the province is extraordinary. Absolutely so. I was talking to Andrew Booth from Abcelera and he said, you know, if we grew a major pharmaceutical in British Columbia, it would surpass the GDP of Saskatchewan. Like this is the value, like the number of jobs and what the economic value is because it's not then just stays here, it becomes an export, which is vitally important to building our economy. Yeah, it's exactly correct and uh, I agree with Andrew's assessment. And it's interesting because um, so many jurisdictions are chasing life sciences right now. Um, we have an exceptional opportunity in front of us, truly exceptional, in that we have the fastest growing life sciences sector and it's hotly competed for. The companies that are growing here are being asked to move elsewhere all the time. And so it's important that government make investments in this sector for a couple of reasons. We want to support that growth, but we also want to support it staying in British Columbia. And that's one of the reasons that we've designed the uh, biomanufacturing and life sciences uh, strategy and why we've made direct investments in companies like Abcelera. Mm -hmm. I think you know we made a $75 million investment that unlocked $225 million from the feds and $400 million from Abcelera themselves for a $700 million campus right in Mount Pleasant. So important. But it's being built right now. Right now. Yeah. And it's so important to anchor these companies here. And we, we hear this terminology quite often, anchor companies. And there's a couple of pieces to that. Yes, it's about ensuring that they stay, that there's a vibrant ecosystem for them to be successful in and they stay here and can grow here and can scale here. But the other piece about an anchor company is that it feeds the entire ecosystem. Um, I, my background in technology was in video games and an anchor company that we have in town is e, in EA, Electronic Arts. And back in the early 2000s, I'm dating myself a bit, but someone from the Georgia Strait did this, I think it was Blaine Kylo, did this extraordinary uh, tree that tracked all of these uh, startup video game companies, 40 or 50 companies in the ecosystem and how many of them had spent time at EA. And it was, it was incredible. EA was the sort of tree of life that had led to this ecosystem because people learn a very high degree of expertise and process and diligence and then apply it in their own companies. And it's not to say that it's all take from the anchor company because often the anchor company will then buy those smaller companies and bring them back in. It's a very vibrant ecosystem. And I imagine the same thing happening in life sciences. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Well, EA is an interesting example, of course. Started here, Don Matrick uh, builds it up, then uh, winds up going out and finding the partner that he wants, but they've remained here. And this, this is what becomes essential. And so, as you say, you can feed, you can draw the lines back to EA. Mm -hmm. On the high tech side, we can do the same thing with McDonald Detweiler. Yes. You go back to the early days of McDonald Detweiler, they're doing remote sensing imaging that has now become the gold standard. We all use it all the time in our Google Maps now. Uh, um, and But the number of people who had worked in those organizations that wound up creating other organizations and on and on and on. So this is why it's important. What in particular though can your government do to help remove some of the barriers that ensure that they will stay here because we don't always have the best tax advantage and and not just for the company but when you start to get employees that make a lot of money they they face some challenges too and do they deserve <laughs> you know that we pay attention to that because it's such a competitive uh environment or do we say well you know that's part of the price of being here in british columbia you know, the way that I look at this question is that I, I think looking at tax isolated by itself doesn't tell the whole picture. We have a competitive tax environment. We're not the cheapest. We're not the most expensive. We're competitive. But I think it's a matrix. I think it's taxation. I think it's access to talent. I think it's um, good governance. You know, I'll share a story that struck me as shocking. 
Uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking to a hydrogen company, and I was concerned about whether the IRA in the U.S., um, the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah. would attract them and pull them away from our ecosystem in Burnaby, what's being referred to as uh, uh, hydrogen Valley. Yes. And they said, no, they, they weren't going to the U.S. because they weren't convinced that the government was stable. What mm -hmm. a shocking statement that is. You know, and I don't want to debate that topic. I'll leave that to, to other folks. But I think that good governance is an important part of this measure, stability, predictability. Um, there are many things that people look at when they're choosing where to stay and where to grow their companies. It's not just tax. And we've got a, a number of different uh, tools in our disposal to assist with that. So, for example, since we came into government, we've put 2,900 new tech seats in, in our universities. We've got another 3,000 coming. Investing in people and training is deeply, deeply important. Part of our strategy in the biotech strategy is to stand up a national biotech training center, which we've done in collaboration with the federal government. It'll be training 750 wet lab specialists every year using the CASELS training program from Ireland. These are important inputs that people consider when they're looking at growing their companies here. You, you touched on an interesting point about governance. Uh, in a book published last year by the Trilateral Commission called The New Spirit of Capitalism, mm -hmm. uh, the authors point to the fact that without that stable uh, governance model where uh, the private sector says, okay, I know that these are the rules and that they're going to be there for the next... 15 to 20 years, yeah. then I know that I, my investment in what it is that I'm trying to build is going to be within a regulated environment that I can trust isn't going to keep shifting all the time. Exactly so. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So you touch on Ireland. I mean, we take a look at the model of what Ireland has been able to do over the last 30 years. Uh, they have become one of the global powerhouses mm -hmm. in the development of this very sector. What can we learn from them? We learn a lot from Ireland, actually. Um, the example I just gave of the National uh, Biotech Training Centre, we've taken the Irish training materials and are applying them. Um, they've got a tremendous amount of expertise, and there are many people from Ireland that are now working in our ecosystem. Ireland has, um, you know, they're about the size that we are, and the size of this uh, sector is, is extremely oversized. So they've done a very, very good job of growing the sector, and they understand that uh, these are very well-paying jobs and they're benefits to their community as well. And I think that's really important. When we look at a $75 million investment in a private company, it's correct for our voters, for my constituents, to ask me, why should the nickels from my pocket go into that? And there's a lot of answers for that. One, it's going to help grow our economy broadly. You know, I, I think that British Columbia's economy is changing quite rapidly right now in terms of what the traditional sources are. And forestry is always going to be deeply important to us. Forestry is important. Sustainable forestry will always continue. But we are seeing a shift in terms of the number of people employed in traditional industry and where we're going in the future, which is a knowledge-based economy. They're not really as separate as they sound. We can talk more about that. But the opportunity for us to grow this sector and have it become a, a very valued component of our economy is strong, and that's good for everyone. These are well-paying jobs. But on top of that, as part of our biotech strategy, we also have um, a commitment to additional clinical testing, uh, clinical trials, and first-stage clinical trials. We don't do that many uh, level one clinical trials in British Columbia. It's later on. And those early-stage clinical trials are very, very meaningful for folks who can access them. Um, these are the Hail Marys. And it's got real-world implications on people's lives when they're unwell. So there are major benefits uh, to these investments, not only in terms of the economy, but in a very personal way for people who are struggling with illness. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Going back to Ireland, um, I did an interview with the person who heads up the, uh, you know, their outreach program, their economic development around biotech, and uh, he pointed out two things. Uh, we go out of our way to make sure that those wet labs that you're talking about are pretty much ready to go before we're going to start to court somebody to come into Ireland. I don't know that they're as focused on 
the homegrown strategy that we are, like they they try to attract mm -hmm. international companies to come in. But they say, but here's the trick. We don't do it all just around Dublin. Mm -hmm. uh, we've moved it out to a wide variety of other communities in the country. Mm -hmm. One, because we don't want to have such a concentration of wealth in Dublin that it drives the cost of everything through the roof. And it's a distribution of economic opportunity into other communities. Yeah. And I wonder whether or not there is possibilities like that within British Columbia. I am very interested in that. I, I think it's really important that we ensure that opportunities are spread throughout British Columbia. This is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. I'm particularly interested in helping uh, tech companies explore opportunities outside of Metro, Victoria, and Kelowna, which are our current three tech hubs. And I think there's tremendous opportunity. And part of that is about what you've identified, that the pressures on cities are already very high. Part of it is about just equality of opportunity. You know, I, I'm a small town kid. I grew up in Nanaimo. And I was a kid that loved the stars and loved science and was good at math. and. Um, there weren't the opportunities there for me at that time, you know, in the 70s and 80s, um, to do the, the kind of things that I've been able to do in my career. And I think they could have been, and they certainly can be now. Um, I'd, I'd like to see more opportunity for people in the regions. It's really important that folks not have to move to the city in order to have successful careers. So it's definitely something we're interested in, in incentivizing. So one of the other components in this is, of course, having access to uh, industrial lands, which yes. are harder and harder to come by. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think, isn't there a fantastic opportunity to work with so many First Nations mm -hmm. that uh, may not have been like in the line of, uh, of uh, some kind of economic opportunity because a highway wasn't close by or some of the other natural resources that were needed to be able to make that could happen. But suddenly now you have an opportunity to develop lands that might not have appeared attractive before, but can be. And does this also then become a part of a strategy that allows us to work towards what I'm hoping will be economic reconciliation? Absolutely. And I see a lot of economic reconciliation occurring around me uh, in this job. And it's one of my favorite aspects of the work, frankly. And it's interesting because sometimes I'll meet people who say, you know, we've We've got this shortage of industrial land and, you know, another problem is First Nations are, you know, more land is being transitioned to First Nations. But I don't see that that way at all. Yeah. I, I think it's quite different than that. And when you um, meet with, and I've had the privilege of meeting with many First Nations leaders, uh, of course, they're looking very deeply at all of the opportunities to have economic uh, self-sufficiency and have opportunities and they're, they're weighing uh, what those different opportunities can be. So it's a wonderful time to be collaborating with First Nations on their objectives. And I think it's actually a, a time of great opportunity, not the opposite. We've concentrated quite heavily on life sciences and biomedicine, but you also touched on, you know, well, forestry is not gonna go away. And I know that the amount of innovation and uh, technological uh, shifts and changes that are happening in British Columbia on the you know high tech side is also building out that aspect of of the industry mm -hmm. which is also exportable yeah. um, so you, I guess my way of asking you're not focused just on life sciences you also have an eye on uh, the high tech sector we've got the digital technology supercluster yeah. uh, here and then of course we've got AI an emerging center of AI excellence. We, we do, and I, it's interesting. There's, there's just so much happening in technology in British Columbia. Uh, you probably know that CBRE has identified that we're the fastest growing tech sector in North America, again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, again, coming back to this sort of frontier thinking, there's a lot of that that occurs in British Columbia, very innovative, very entrepreneurial, very cutting edge. Uh, that's quite an advantage for us, paired with the excellence and training that we provide here. Um, but I think there's another piece, which is we, we have traditional industries and big traditional industry that are very interested in technology. And when, when I spoke earlier and said traditional industry here and, and knowledge-based economy there, that's a false dichotomy. It's actually like this. Um, there are many examples of very, very 
cutting edge uh, technologies being applied to traditional industry. And as you've said, it's um, not only a benefit for us domestically in terms of uh, ways to enhance performance and um, implications in terms of lower GHGs and solutions like that, but it also gives us the opportunity to export. So there's some truly excellent work going on, and some of it's in AI, um, but in other areas as well. So it's it's a pretty interesting time. And what, one of the authors that I really enjoy reading on this topic is Dan Bresnett, which um, he has a book, Innovation in Real Spaces. And it's it really is on this topic that sometimes when people think about innovation, they think about the next great thing that hasn't been done yet. But often innovation is where we currently are, how we can do it better, and how does technology help us deliver that? And that's something that we're really good at here. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. The last time I saw you was back in May when you were on our panel on Conversations Live and we were talking about this very sector. And I was, you know, sort of brewing the fact that I didn't ask you, so what's coming up next? Because then there was a plethora of announcements and, and a wide range of activity. <laughs> I thought, ah, I should have had you say that. What's over the horizon right now is, when, you know, we're in the fall of 2023. What's over the horizon? Uh, I've got a great piece of work on my desk right now that I'm not able to talk about. It's oh, driving me crazy. On. I wish yeah, I could. Just let me in on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, as soon as we're ready to launch, I'll come back and do another session on it. But it is, uh, it's a piece of work that's important and, and uh, I'm really focused on um, pulling together the different aspects of our economy and, and seeing it in a cohesive way and helping drive forward. So uh, there's a lot of work going on and um, it, it's just an exciting time to be in government, frankly, because there are so many um, truly deeply innovative pieces of work cross, happening across our economy. You know, I, I, I love this job. I feel like I'm getting a free PhD in British Columbia and to be able to see what's happening in so many different sectors is fascinating, you know. Um, our hydrogen sector, for example, we've got the nickname of Hydrogen Valley now, similar to Silicon Valley, because 55% of all hydrogen companies in Canada are based here in BC, and most of them in Burnaby, uh, Ballard being an anchor company, but many others. I, I recently toured uh, Cellcentric, which is a German and Swedish-backed company that are solving for using hydrogen for really, really large uh, shipping challenges. and. Uh, having tremendous success, um, many other hydrogen companies as well. So there's just a lot happening in the ecosystem right now, and um, it's it's a very exciting time. It really is. I'd love to talk more about hydrogen because it blends perfectly with everything, helps to lower the GHG uh, of every fuel that, that gets burned. Um, the remarkable opportunities for people of all backgrounds and ages in, in the sector. I mean, it's incredible. But I'm out of time. <laughs> we'll have to have you come back another time. But your comments are really valid because really when you look at the, uh, the economic plan that we've rolled forward, it's focused on two things, sustainability and equality, right? Access for everyone to have well-paying jobs and successful careers and sustainability. And those two mm. pieces are, are rolling out very nicely in British mm. Columbia. Okay, I'll go a moment longer here because I remember in a conversation that I had with Maria Clave, who's the uh, president of Harvey Mudd, college down in Claremont, California, you know that she comes out of UBC and went on, you know, was at Princeton University on the board of Microsoft for years and what, and, and has made incredible uh, gains in uh, making sure that there's gender equality within Harvey Met is a computer. world leader. Yep. Um, in, in computing sciences. And she said, but here's the amazing thing is, it's not just for those who are entering careers right now. He said, she said, um, you could be wrapping up one element of your career. You can go back to school for a year or two and like that you're programming. Uh, and so the opportunities exist for everybody in, in, in this sector and it's very true. Jobs. It's very true. They're very good jobs. And yeah. we've just rolled out the Future Ready Skills Program. It's a $343 million commitment. That's not true. It's 400, $483 million commitment um, that's about helping people train for the jobs of the future. And yeah. included in that is 400 micro-credentials. So people can take a 12 or 18 week course and actually transition from one area of the economy to another or build on something that they're currently doing and become uh, better at it. So 
it's a really interesting time. And if people are looking to make a transition in their career, this is a good time to do it. Well, you are an exciting in an exciting part of our of our government. Yes, sir. Yeah. I really am. Yeah. Thanks for your time today. Thanks very much for having me.